Hello and welcome to another sociology revision video on stratification brought to you from me, Ben, at All Sociology. Today's video is going to be all about one topic, really, which is about poverty. Now, poverty crops up on your second paper at GCSE, which is on stratification and differentiation. And so what I'm going to do with you guys today is talk to you through a little bit about what poverty is and what deprivation is. So hopefully you can now see me uh, up in my top right hand corner where I should be. And you can see the menu of today's video. What we're going to cover is an overview on poverty. I'm going to cover a few things about different types of poverty. Then we'll take a look at poverty and social groups. So how poverty affects for instance, different classes, genders, sexualities, ethnicities, and so on and so forth. We'll have a look and see what different theories have to say about poverty. So that kind of ties in with some of the stuff I've done previously, but I'm going to give a recap on that. Then we will do a bit of a deep dive into what deprivation is, looking at different types of deprivation. And then finally finishing off with, as I always do uh, recently, uh, 10 key terms from this video that uh, hopefully you know and understand. And we'll finish with a nine mark mini essay exam question. So without further ado, let's get into what we're doing today. So let's do an overview of poverty. What is poverty, first of all? I mean, firstly, poverty is about being poor. That's ultimately what poverty is. But there's two types of poverty that you're going to need to know at GCSE. So the first type is what we call absolute poverty or sometimes known as extreme poverty. And this is where basically people are so poor that they lack the money or the resources, so the things that might meet their basic needs. By that, what we mean is things like food, clothing and shelter. So we're talking about the absolute poorest in society. Most commonly, when we think about absolute poverty, we don't really tend to think about the UK other than perhaps a very, a very sort of minority of people, maybe homeless people, we tend to think more of absolute poverty as affecting more developing countries. So perhaps some countries in Africa or Asia or South America, for instance. Now, the other type of poverty you are going to need to know about is arguably a more sort of salient type of poverty, especially for you guys uh, taking your GCSE exam. So the type of poverty we're talking about here is called relative poverty. Now, this isn't where you lack the money and resources to meet your basic needs. You can often meet your basic needs, but relative poverty is about lacking money and resources compared to the average person. So what this basically means is that after paying for your absolute basics, your, you know, your, your home, so your, your rent, your uh, rent, and uh, mortgage, that kind of thing, and your food and your energy, you're probably still struggling to get those little extras in life. So this is actually a really, really big issue in UK society. Um, research from the Joseph Browntree Foundation, who I've mentioned before on this uh, video or on these series of videos, uh, they're a pov poverty charity specifically, and they estimate that up to 20%, that's one fifth of people in the UK are currently living in relative poverty. So the types of people this tends to affect is working class people and underclass people. So underclass being people who don't have jobs, who uh, live off state benefits, but also working class people, and some might even argue uh, lower middle class people as well. So it's not just about people who don't work, this is affecting people who are working as well. Now, relative poverty is very closely linked to something called relative deprivation. And that's a top, uh, a sort of an issue I'm going to talk about later on in the video. Very quickly, what is relative deprivation? It's being without the things that most people can afford to have. So that might be, for instance, being able to afford your energy bills. It might be, uh, for instance, being able to afford to run a car or that kind of thing. OK, so let's have a think about some of the causes of inequality and some of the causes of poverty. There's really two ways to look at this. So the first way is looking at some of the, the reasons why people might end up in poverty. So we might look, for instance, the classic example would be things like educational underachievement, so not doing very well at school, getting poor grades, that then leading subsequently onto uh, either being unemployed or working in a very low paid job, uh, therefore getting low income, so keeping your money that you get at a quite a low level. But it's also due to things that are outside of people's control. So it could be things like rising cost of living. That's something we've heard a lot about in the last couple of years, particularly with things like the energy crisis and food bills going up, those kind of things. Alongside that, you've got issues of deprivation. So people living without things perhaps they should be living with. So, for instance, uh, access to heating or broadband, those kind of things. But then you've also got, again, out of people's control, ways in which they might experience discrimination. So that might be the case that you can't get a job because people are discriminating against you on grounds of your gender, your age, your ethnicity, and so on and so forth. 
We've got the t a, a, a term there called social exclusion. Social exclusion is about not feeling part of society, and that might be for any number of reasons. It tends to affect particular social groups. So, for instance, uh, older people, disabled people, and people who feel like they don't have a role in life or they haven't got anything to offer or society deems them to be unimportant and so they're excluded they're not seen as someone important also we've got there things like government cuts and low life charts so government cuts would be things like cuts to uh, benefits as well so people perhaps living on benefits perhaps what the uh, new right referred to as people living in the underclass are finding it harder to make ends meet because of the fact that those benefits have been cut now aside from the sort of the reasons we can look at there some of which are completely out of people's control as to reasons why they end up in poverty we can also think there about what theories say now i'm going to come back to this at a later point in this video so i'm only going to skim over this very briefly but there are sort of like there's three main theoretical views on poverty and why poverty happens so uh, if you remind yourselves i've looked at this in previous videos when i've looked at like theoretical views of functionalists and marxists and the new right stratification so if you haven't already go back and have a little look at those videos on uh, episode 15 and also uh, 14 as well but functionalists would ultimately say it's because society is a meritocracy if you work hard you'll get to the top ultimately what functionalists say is poverty affects people who don't work hard enough the new right sort of take it a little bit further and say it's also about people who don't work hard enough but ultimately it's due to people who get into this culture of poverty it's a quite that's a sort of a quote or a term by charles murray from the new right that basically poverty breeds poverty so if you grow up in poverty you get socialized into that kind of culture of poverty and on the other hand you've got marxists who say it's completely poverty is completely due to capitalism it's an inequality that's caused by that class distinction between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat so right the bottom of the proletariat you've got the people living in poverty so what are some of the consequences and what are some of like the implications of poverty in society well excuse me the first thing we need to be aware of is that it does disproportionately affect certain social groups so by that what i mean is that it's people from ethnic minorities women older people those with disabilities those types of social groups are statistically more likely to be living in poverty and there's a bunch of reasons for that we'll have a look at different social groups uh, shortly but also we want to be thinking about the consequences in terms of broader social issues so I've mentioned previously social exclusion. You've got more and more people who are feeling that they don't have a role to play in society because perhaps they're, they're, they don't have enough money to do the things they want to do. Alongside that, you've got this topic or concept. I keep using the word topic, that's the wrong the right word, the term of marginalization. This is something I've referred to in a previous video. So if you think of a, a sheet of paper, and on the left hand side you've got that small bit there which is the margin it's the unimportant bit it's the bit you don't write on imagine if that bit of paper was society the margin is where people who are deemed to be unimportant or un insignificant get pushed to because they're not seen again to have a role to play in society so marginalization and social exclusion very much linked together uh, we've got there something called a cycle of deprivation so this is the idea basically that once you get into poverty it's very very difficult to get out of poverty lots of people just say like functionists or the new right would say well it's easy to get out of poverty all you've got to do is work harder but that's not actually true because we can think about lots of people who have two even three jobs working really really hard working as many hours as they can and they cannot pull themselves out of poverty due to things like low wages and as a result what we're seeing is more and more people living in what we call in work poverty so people who have got full-time jobs who can cannot make enough money due to low wages in order to um, have the things that most people can afford. So people living in relative poverty, even though they are working as well. So we're going to move on and we're now going to have a bit of a deep dive into how poverty affects different social groups. Now, I've pulled on the left hand side of this screen here. We've got class, ethnicity, gender disability and age now at this point i suppose what would be a quite a good idea if you're trying to revise this stuff is just to pause this video and have a think about those five different social groups and think what is the way in which poverty affects these groups what are, the, are there specific consequences for these people are there specific reasons why these people might end up in poverty but if you want to have a go at that that'd be awesome if not i'm going to run through this with you now so it's fairly straightforward when it comes to class because there are massive links between for instance um the class you end up in and 
the educational experience you have. So if you achieve in education, the likelihood is that you're not going to end up in poverty because you'll go on to get a better paid job. Uh, but if you don't do so well, the, the kind of consequences are ultimately that you will end up in a poorer paid job. And that as a result, that issue of in work poverty can be a real issue for you. We've also got the role, as I've mentioned previously, of the underclass. So it's not just about uh, people who are in in work poverty it's also people who live on uh, or living and um uh, surviving on government benefits and that could be for any number of reasons not due to any fault of their own for instance so for instance i've been on benefits before i've been on job seekers allowance there might be people who are on long-term illness or sickness benefits as well and the new right have a particular view on the underclass and they would basically say that people end up in poverty because it's too easy not to just claim government benefits. So someone like Charles Murray basically says that the government give out all of these benefits, they're very generous, but they're really not. And what this does is it provides what Murray refers to as a perverse incentive. It gives a reason for people not to work and as a result, just rely on government handouts. Now, what he argues is that if you grow up in a household where people are both, say you've got mum and dad both living and they are living on benefits, this breeds a form of culture of poverty where you are social into looking up as mum and dad as role models, seeing them not going to work, and that socialises children in those uh, families into the idea that it's a norm not to go to work. So this is what Murray and the New Right mean by a culture of poverty affecting specifically the underclass. But as I've said, it also affects working class people, and you could even argue it affects lower middle class people as well who are on poorer paid jobs. So that's a bit of class. There are obviously links between class and ethnicity, but I'm going to talk to you very briefly about some of the specific issues with ethnicity. So according to the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, ethnic minorities are twice as likely to live in poverty than white people. So you've got that link there between ethnic minorities tend to be poorer. So if you're ever stuck and you get a question on ethnic minorities and you're not sure what to say, you can always link that to class and use one of those class arguments. Why is it that ethnic minorities tend to be uh, more in poverty? Well, there's a couple of reasons, and we can look at the role that racism or racial discrimination plays. For instance, in uh, reducing job opportunities for people from ethnic minorities. So this, is, this has a big effect on unemployment rates, which again are higher amongst ethnic minorities. But aside from that and that kind of individual racism that you might experience on a job interview or something like that, you've also got issues of institutional racism within workplaces. So institutional racism is the way in which racism sort of seeps itself into the systems and the processes of different organisations or institutions. One might be a workplace or a company. And for example, what we can do is look here at the fact that ethnic minorities get paid almost a quarter less than white people. And again, that's what something we might refer to as the ethnicity pay gap okay so basically looking at the fact that uh, one of the reasons why ethnic minorities tend to be more likely in poverty is because they are more likely to be discriminated against and they earn less money on average than white people now i've mentioned uh, uh, a few things about gender in a previous video so if you haven't already go back and watch uh, issue issue episode number 16 which covers all of these types of issues but in a little bit more detail when it comes to uh, gender and poverty, women are more likely to live in poverty than men. One of the reasons for that is due to women work less than men. And one of the reasons for that is because women tend to be carers for children. So if you look at all of the uh, lone parent families in Britain, for instance, nine out of 10 of those are what we call matrifocal or headed by a woman. So it would be a mum at the head of that lone parent family in nine out of 10 times and only one out of 10 times will it be a man. You've also, as I mentioned, you've got those employment differences. So women tend to work less full-time jobs than men, which means lower income overall. You've also got the fact that women work more part-time jobs. So it's again going to be lower income. But then you've got some of those issues that are out you know, completely in, in, in respect to the workplace. So you've got things like the gender pay gap. I've just mentioned the ethnicity pay gap. You've got the gender pay gap as well. We estimate that to be about 15%. So for every uh, £100 a man earns in one job, in the same job, it's estimated that women earn only £85. So there's a 15% difference there. And you've also got this, uh, this term called the glass ceiling. I covered this in my previous video on, on gender and other topics as well. So the glass ceiling is the idea that women can see the top jobs in society like the CEOs, the management positions, directors, but they can't break through this invisible glass ceiling because men are holding those top positions. And I think uh, one of the sort of um, examples I gave in the previous video was along the lines of if you look at the top companies in Britain, only about 10% of them are sort of headed by a female, so a female CEO. 
The other thing we just want to be mentioning here as well, and it's important to know this, is that women live longer than men by about four or five years on average. So what this has got to do with poverty is because women live longer than men, often if you have um, a couple living together, so a husband and wife obviously been together for, for a long time, men tend to pass away before their female partners. This leaves women on their own. And often this will then mean that women uh, only have got one pension coming in. And often because women didn't work as much as men in the past, that pension tends to be a smaller amount. So um, unfortunately, when um, older people when their partners die they're left to live on their own but they're also then left with just that one income which can lead to poverty as well when it comes to disability again i've mentioned this in the previous video there are higher rates of unemployment amongst disabled people despite the fact that you know most disabled people want to work you've also got those who are in work who are getting paid lower amounts of money so they have lower incomes and you've also got the lack of opportunities there so some jobs obviously aren't um sort of as suitable for disabled people or some people might think that certain jobs aren't suitable for disabled people and that might come down to uh, employers attitudes so for instance prejudice prejudgment that uh, employers might have of disabled people thinking that certain people can't do certain jobs it could also be that role of discrimination so where people actually act on that prejudice and so not giving disabled people jobs because of an assumption that they won't be able to do certain things now, I mentioned previously uh, social exclusion and marginalisation. This is a massive issue for disability and dis uh, disabled people in the United Kingdom. So thinking there about what, uh, how disabled people are seen in society, the opportunities they get, and the lack of access they might have to certain things, which means that as a result, they could be more likely to end up in poverty. Last one just to mention age as an issue remember we need to be thinking both about the oldest and the youngest in society um when we get old obviously we're less likely to be able to work so um most people tend to retire you know after age 65 you don't have to retire at age 65 but most people tend to only about one in ten people end up working beyond age 65 so the older we get the less likely we are to be able to support ourselves through that regular income from paid employment instead what happens is we tend to rely on our pensions and there's loads of different types of pensions but one the one that everybody gets is called a state pension and if you only rely on that it's actually a very small amount of money i don't know how much uh, that is a week because i'm not that old yet but it's somewhere about 100 pounds a week and that's going to be a really really tricky thing to try and survive on that small amount of money particularly with the cost of everything going up at the same time but we can't neglect to think about the young people in society as well so age we need to think about young people young people get paid less it's the law that you've got minimum wages for, for different age categories so the younger you are the less you're going to get paid because your employer doesn't have to pay you anymore because the government say we've got this sort of what they call a living wage allowance now and those jobs pay poorly ultimately and so you're more likely to end up in poverty as a result of not having that um, high level of income that perhaps older people might have so there we go, there's some bits and pieces about different social groups, class, ethnicity, gender, disability, and age, and why those social groups might uh, disproportionately be affected by poverty. I'm gonna stop, have a quick drink, and then we're gonna have a look at uh, theoretical views on poverty as well. So with this one, what you wanna be thinking about, there's basically four main theoretical views that have uh, an opinion on poverty. I've kind of done this already, especially with functionalism and the new right and Marxism. Um, I'm going to mention feminism as well. But if you want to go back and have a bit of a better look at these sort of broader issues about how these theories feel about stratification, go back and have a little watch of uh, episode, I think it's 13, where I look at Marxism versus functionalism. And then I do um, a, a bit on uh, the new right as well. So go back and have a watch of those videos if you want to know their broader views on theories of stratification. But at the moment, we're just going to focus on poverty. Functionalists see poverty as a good thing in society. They see it as functional because they say it motivates everyone to work harder. Now, if we remember that stratification hierarchy, the higher up you go, the harder you work, the higher up you go. That's basically what functionists say. So what they would argue is that if you end up at the bottom of society, so you're in poverty, the reason is because you haven't worked hard enough. So the ultimate idea from functionists is that poverty is actually fair. It's a good thing because we see people in poverty and we think, I don't want to end up like you. And that, according to functionists, encourages us to work harder. And the ultimate reason is because society is based on a meritocracy. So it's the idea of Parsons that you have to work hard to get further to the top. It's this idea that social mobility 
is available because all you've got to do is work harder and that will get to the top. Now, there are obvious problems with that. And I'm imagining you can probably think of some of those things. If you can't just imagine the sort of single mum working two or three jobs, who's finding it very, very difficult to get higher up that social hierarchy. The new right take a similar view to the functionist. It's like they go one step further. So again, they're talking about poverty being the fault of the individual. It's your fault for not working hard enough. But again, we need to think here about the role of people like Charles Murray, who would argue that the government aren't helping matters because they are encouraging people to claim benefits. And this is offering this perverse incentive for this dependency culture when you depend on handouts rather than helping yourself. Now, this is an issue that I mentioned previously. Murray says um, specifically affects the underclass, people who don't work for a living. And it means that they end up in this culture of poverty. So again, what that's arguing is that you, if you're a child and you grow up with mum and dad at home or parents at home, not working, you get socialized into that idea that not working is a norm or that getting benefits is a norm. What Murray then argues is that this is, becomes very, very difficult to get out of. It creates what he calls a cycle of deprivation. You cannot get off the wheel because it's very, very hard to break that cycle. And it ends up sort of infecting families and communities, according to Charles Murray. Marxists take a very different view on poverty. It's not the fault of the individual. It's nothing about how, how hard you work or you haven't worked hard enough. According to Marxists, poverty is the result of extreme class inequalities that have been brought about through the capitalist system. Now, because the capitalist controls society, the bourgeoisie at the top of the social hierarchy, they are able to control poverty levels. And if you don't believe me, then what could easily happen is the government and businesses could decide to pay people more money. Why don't they? Because they want to keep their profit margins high and keep themselves at the top of the class structure. So that's what I mean when I say they control poverty. We could fix this if we wanted to. I say we, the rich and the bourgeoisie in society could fix this if they wanted to. The fact is they don't want to because they don't want to risk their position at the top of the social hierarchy. Now, according to um, Marxists, for the capitalists, for the bourgeoisie, poverty only becomes an issue. It's not, a, they don't care about it basically because it's not affecting them. It only becomes a problem when the poor people are too ill or unable to go to work. So as long as people keep, as long as the working class keep turning up every day, every week, doing their menial, low paid working class jobs, the rich are very happy for that to happen. But when people can't do that, those jobs, that's when poverty is going to become an issue for the, uh, the middle classes and the bourgeoisie. But that's not been the case yet because we keep squeezing ourselves at the bottom. Now, for feminists, there is a, a clear focus here on gender. So feminists would argue that poverty disproportionately affects women. And this is just showing evidence of patriarchy throughout the system of society. Now, why is it that women... Uh, tend to be disproportionately affected by poverty. I've mentioned a few issues with gender already. You want to think about those lower earning powers, the fact that women don't have as uh, don't work as full don't work full time as much as men. They tend to have more part time jobs. But you've also got to think about those other issues as well. So the gender pay gap, which is about fifteen percent, the glass ceiling, meaning that women can't get those top CEO positions in society, but also the role of women tending to be the, the caregivers or uh, the one who look after families. Again, hold on to that statistic. One, uh, sorry, nine in 10 lone families are headed by a woman. As a result, you've basically got more mouths to feed. So the money you've got needs to go further than it would generally be the case with men. So we've got there the functionist view and the new right view, very similar. It's the fault of the individual for not working hard enough. The new right take it a little bit further by saying that the government don't help things by encouraging a dependency culture. Marx is completely different. They say it's nothing to do with not working hard enough. That poverty is the result of an unequal uh, capitalist system. And then feminists would argue and focus really on the way in which poverty disproportionately affects women uh, because of those issues like employment patterns, childcare arrangements and the gender pay gap as well. So we're now on to uh, a thing here called relative deprivation. Now, Relative deprivation is really quite similar to poverty. And it's one of those terms that kind of goes hand in hand when you talk about relative poverty. Let's break down what relative deprivation means, first of all. Deprivation, if you're deprived, it means to go without. Relative means compared to others. So basically, relative deprivation is being without things that most people have got or can afford to have. Okay. Now, the reason it's linked to poverty is people living in poverty 
are going to be deprived, they're going to be without those things that most people can expect to have in society. Now, when it comes to deprivation, you need to know a little bit about this fella here, whose name is Peter Townsend. Now, in the 1970s, Peter Townsend was looking into levels of poverty, uh, relative poverty and relative deprivation in Britain, because he wanted to work out just exactly how widespread this issue of relative poverty and relative deprivation was. So what he did was he developed what he called an index, which is basically like a list of things that people should be able to afford beyond the basics. So we're not talking about like, you know, food and shelter and clothes and stuff. We're talking about things that people, most people in society can afford to have, which makes their quality of life a little bit better. So what he was looking at in the, in the 70s was things like, do you own your own car? Do you own your own house? Have you got enough money to afford to eat a balanced and nutritional diet? Are you able to go on holiday once a year? And they're the sorts of things that he said that if you are able to do these things, you are not living in relative deprivation or relative poverty. But if you cannot do those things, you will technically be described as living in relative deprivation. Now, we need to be a little bit careful here about thinking about how this might map onto today's society, because in today's society, certainly um, things like being able to afford to eat a balanced diet, so being able to get afford your fresh fruit and veg, those kind of things, um, is, is a, a still, I think, a very good indicator of relative deprivation. So if you can't afford to eat those things or to, to buy those things regularly, it's probably fair to say that you're living in relative deprivation because most people can afford that. I think the other thing you've got to think about here is things like Wi-Fi. Have you got access to uh, decent fibre broadband at home? Most people do. If you don't, this might be a sort of an indicator that you're also living in relative deprivation. One of the things we cannot overlook here is from the 1970s uh, when... Townsend was talking about the fact that you you know if you can't afford to buy your own home you'll be living in relative deprivation that's changed so much because it's so 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 difficult to be able to buy your own home now and it's very much something that we see very much as a reserve of the middle classes so it's very difficult to be able to buy your own home so using that as a, as a measure for relative deprivation now wouldn't be any good but I think that the issues about affording a balanced diet could you afford broadband, Wi-Fi connections? Those things would be very similar to what uh, Townsend was looking at in the 1970s. So it's important to be aware that relative deprivation isn't just about what you can afford and the material inequalities that might exist in society. So material deprivation basically means to be without money and physical things that money can buy things that might affect your life chances so for instance not having the money to be able to afford to go to university or living in a house that's overcrowded because you can't afford to uh, have, have a room for everyone in your house or those kind of things they're sorts of things we might look at now as being why people who live in poverty are materially deprived you cannot afford the things the things you can touch like a house or a diet or anything else I say diet, food that you can touch that other people can't afford. But it's also about what we call cultural deprivation. So it's not just about things you can touch and that money can buy. It's also about things like values, ideas, knowledge and experiences. So cultural deprivation is about not having those opportunities to have the experiences or the knowledge or the support that's required to become a successful adult. So here's an example thinking, for instance, about not being given the opportunities and encouragement in life. So not have that kind of nice nurturing background, the way in which people speak to you, are they speaking to you, uh, you know, using full English? Are they, um, are, for instance, you being socialised in a way that's going to allow you to be successful in life? So when we talk about relative deprivation, it's important to be reminded of the fact that it's not just about what you can and can't afford there is a cultural aspect to it and if you think here what's the link with cultural deprivation we looked at in a previous video uh pierre bourdieu's concept of cultural capital which is very very similar to this so ultimately what we're saying here with poverty the link between poverty and relative deprivation it can lead families and communities to entering this cycle of deprivation where it's very very hard to break that cycle so to get back from a position of being in poverty to have social mobility to pull yourselves up and out of poverty it's very very difficult and again murray would argue that this is create uh, that the government in benefits create what he calls a culture of poverty 
We are nearly at the end of this video. I haven't banged on as long as I normally do, which is wonderful. I'm hoping that I'll be finished in the next five minutes, which will be delighted to know about, I'm sure. Uh, 10 key terms in this video. So what have I talked about? Absolute poverty. Absolute poverty is the type of poverty where you cannot afford to meet your basic needs in society. So that would be not being able to afford food, clothing or shelter it generally tend, we tend to think of people who are homeless or people living in developing countries who are affected most by absolute poverty but relative poverty is where you are living in a type of poverty where you can't afford the things that most people can so it's you could afford your basics your food clothes and shelter but beyond that you can't afford much else so lots of people we estimate about 20 percent of the uk currently living in relative poverty Related to relative poverty is uh, Townsend's concept of relative deprivation. This is just where you can't afford the things that most people can. So Townsend was looking at things like being able to afford your own home, being able to afford your own car, being able to go on holiday once a year. If you can't do those types of things, uh, then according to him in the 1970s, you were living in relative deprivation. But we've now considered that perhaps we want to think about things like access to fibre broadband and uh, being able to pay energy bills might be good, good signs that you're not living in relative deprivation in 2023. And material deprivation, so relative debt is made up of two things. I'll bring them both up. Material deprivation is not being able to afford the physical things that perhaps most people can. So whether that's, for instance, um, a car or a house. Also, you've got your cultural deprivation. So where you've been socialised and brought up without those opportunities, experiences, values that you might associate with people who are more successful. We looked at the impact of poverty on social groups, so thinking specifically about class, so working class and the underclass, gender, so women, ethnicity, ethnic minorities, disabled people, age, both the old and the young tend to be disproportionately affected by poverty, and there's a whole load of reasons for that. We looked at some of the theory links, so looking at basically the functionist and the new right view, that essentially poverty is the fault of the individual for not working hard enough. Marxists say it's the fault of capitalism, feminist focus on the disproportionate levels of women in poverty. Uh, Charles Murray's concept there, so Charles Murray from the New Right, his idea of the underclass, the underclass are those who live on benefits, and according to people like Charles Murray, benefits provide people a culture of poverty, and this basically means that they just get into the habit of uh, relying on handouts, and according to Murray and others, this then creates or poverty, relative poverty, and specifically poverty amongst the underclass creates a cycle of deprivation. It's very, very hard to break that cycle and to have that social mobility to pull yourselves up from the bottom of society uh, further towards the top. So there we go. <clears throat> um, as always, I'm going to do a bit on exams as well. So I'm going to squeeze through this little bit. Uh, what do you need to know? Uh, you should know that Strat Diff is a blooming big topic in paper too. How big is it? it? Well, out of seven sections on the paper, it makes up three of those sections, sections three, four, and five, and it actually amounts to 49 out of 100 marks. So nearly 50% of your marks are going to be on stratification and differentiation. Now, the types of questions you're going to get asked are two marks, four marks, and nine mark questions. And I'm going to take you through a nine mark mini essay question now. So the question I'm going to sort of look at with you is those living in poverty need to change the way they live to improve their lives. Do you agree with this view? Now, at this point in the video, it will be a great opportunity for you to have a think about how you would answer that question. So how do you do it? You need to answer it with a very brief introduction. My introduction would be something like some sociologists think people in poverty uh, do need to change the way they live, whereas others don't in order to get themselves out of poverty. That's my introduction. You're then going to need a couple of paragraphs. Now, you're going to need to look at theories of uh, sociological theories and what they say about poverty. I think you can squeeze one in there on the functionist view. You might even throw in a bit of new right on that as well. What's the most different theory to functionalism when it comes to poverty? Marxism. So I would have an introduction, very short, a paragraph on what functionists say about why poverty happens, a paragraph on why Marxists say poverty happens, and you're going to finish it off with a weak conclusion that's just going to reiterate what you said, that basically there's different opinions on this. Okay, so if you want to have a think about that question how you'd answer it you're looking at roughly about just shy of a side pay, paper maybe a side for this have, pause this video now and have a go at that i'm now going to go through how i would have answered that question so if you don't want to know pause it and there we go should have mentioned that this is one of those points where 
if you take the Educast GCSE spec, this is bang right up your alley because this is exactly the style of question you're going to be asked. If you take AQA or something else, it will be slightly different for you, but it doesn't mean that what I'm about to read through is not going to be useful for you. So how would I answer this question? I would start it, as I say, with a very short introduction. Some sociologists argue that poverty is the fault of individual, whereas others say that society is to blame. Let's talk through my functionist paragraph. Functionists like Parsons say society is meritocratic, where everyone gets the same chances, and through hard work, anyone can achieve. Consequently, those with Excuse me, those who work the hardest get the best jobs and succeed, and those who don't end up in a lower position in the social strata. For functionists, poverty plays the role of acting to motivate people to work harder to avoid it, suggesting it helps people in poverty or those close to it to change the way they live to improve their lives. New rights sociologists like Murray, however, claim that the government does not help people to help themselves by providing generous welfare benefits that encourage a dependency culture amongst the growing underclass. Let's now contrast that with the Marxist view. So Marxists, on the other hand, would argue that there is no way that people in poverty can improve their lives because the capitalist system is at fault for their position in society. Marx argued that poverty is the inevitable result of a system that encourages the exploitation of the working classes by a bourgeoisie that aims to generate profit and wealth for itself at the cost of everyone else in society. Marxists would look at issues like in-work poverty, which is a growing trend, with some people working three or more jobs. This shows that no matter how hard some people work, they cannot escape poverty. Moreover, some social groups like those from ethnic minorities, women and older people and those from disabilities may be more likely statistically to live in poverty than other social groups, further showing evidence that there is nothing that some people can do to avoid poverty. Now you can hopefully see from both of those paragraphs, I've basically reused that language of the question to at least change the way they live to improve their lives. And I've said yes in paragraph one for the Marxist and functionist view, so it's the functionist and the new right view, and no in the second paragraph for the Marxist view. Quick conclusion, literally has to be a sentence or two. Sociologists have different views about the best ways out of poverty, but what remains clear is that some groups are disproportionately affected by poverty and that for many, relative poverty is on the rise. Now, that's a very good answer because when I wrote it, I'm only joking. It's a good answer because it covers off two theoretical views. It is peppered with key terms. I've got in there some analysis and some evaluation. So in my first paragraph, I get my analysis and evaluation by bringing in the new right and sort of comparing that to um, the functionist view. And in the second paragraph, what I do to get my analysis and evaluation there is bring in my issues about different social groups and mentioning that it disproportionately affects some people more than others. So just to recap, for those at the back, uh, what have we gone through today? I've given you an overview on poverty. I've talked about different types of poverty. I've looked at the ways in which poverty can disproportionately affect social groups, namely uh, the lower social classes, women, people with disabilities, older people, younger people, and ethnic minorities. We've looked at the role that functionists, the new right, Marxists and feminists have to say about why poverty disproportionately affects particular groups and why it happens. We've considered the issue of deprivation, looking at Townsend's uh, Relative Deprivation Index and thought about how deprivation is made up of both material and cultural inequalities. I ran through those 10 key terms for you and we've just gone through a nine mark exam question on different views about why poverty happens. So that's that, that's me. I'm coming back now very, very briefly to say thank you very much for watching this video if you've made it this far. If you have, well done. A um, couple of things to say very quickly. Uh, three things you can do if you've learned something or you've enjoyed this video, three things you can do. Number one, like and subscribe to the channel. There's going to be more of these coming out. The closer we get to the exams, I'm going to be throwing out more and more of these. So that's the first thing you can do. Like and subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything. Something else doesn't cost you anything. If you know somebody else who does sociology and you think, ah, oh, they might find this helpful as well, just mention it to them. Drop them a link, get the, get the uh, link from the description, send it to them, see if they find it helpful as well, or mention it to them as you're having a, a pint with them or a coffee with them or whatever. And the final thing you could do might cost you a couple of quid, but if you were to meet me in real life and thought, you know what, that guy's really helped me out, I'd love to buy you a coffee or a pint, you can do that. There's a couple of ways you can do it. First way is to go onto patreon.com slash all sociology. You can buy me a pint. You can buy me a cup of coffee. That'd be massively appreciated. Or if you want to, you can drop me a super like in the comments and that you get options to give me a quid or two quid or something like that. So there's some ways if you found it useful, you can say thank you. 
If not, don't worry about it. But you don't, I'm not expecting anyone to pay anything like that. Just to like and subscribe or mention it to someone else would be massively, massively helpful for me. This, in fact, has been my last video on stratification, which means that the next topic we're going to look at is crime and deviance, which also crops up on the second GCSE paper from Educast. So keep an eye out for that. Make sure you're subbed. Make sure you've got your alerts on because those videos on crime and deviance will be coming very, very soon. Until next time, ladies and gents, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for watching. I've been Ben. You've been the people. I'll see you later. Bye.